All right, I am here on Economics in Quarantine. We are talking with Professor Harry Crane about statistics, the misuse of statistics, and the use of statistics when analyzing COVID-19. We are talking about COVID-19 here. Professor Harry Crane is, uh, it's a great honor to, for him to be on here. Professor Crane is a professor at Rutgers University in New Jersey. He is also the co-founder of Researchers.One, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, right now, we're talking about coronavirus. There are, as of today, based on the Johns Hopkins University data, 1,617,204 global confirmed cases of coronavirus and 97,039 deaths. Much of that comes from the United States, where there are 466,299 USA cases and 16,703 deaths in the United States, we are told based on models that this is going to be 60,000. And we'll get to the modeling in a minute. But when it comes to COVID-19 reporting, we are bombarded, it seems, by figures. There is a danger in analyzing these data. You had a public disagreement with David Spiegelhalter and John Ioannidis on this. More broadly, you have a paper on researchers.one criticizing so-called naive probabilism a view espoused by many technocrats and academics. Could you walk us through that? And what would you say are the biggest statistical sins committed by so-called experts concerning the coronavirus? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, first of all, thanks to thanks for uh, having me on, and uh, glad to glad to talk about this. So, the, the so there's a lot of lot of questions, uh, kind of a lot of things to kind of cover in there. Uh, the the naive probabilism bit, which I'll get to in a second. That was that was really in response to um, something. That, that, well, that was what, what triggered me to write that and to think more about that was something that uh, Cass Sunstein had written um, back in late February. Um, so I guess kind of going in chronological order, Kat, and really my um, interest in this and most of what I was writing on this was, I think, more relevant, say, a month ago than it is today, um, after we're all kind of already in, we're kind of in this thing and we're, we're figuring, out, figuring out our way out of it. My, my objective then was to try to avoid getting into it in the first place. And so the, the, the Spiegelhalter bit, first of all, that was, that was really a, a minor, to me, it was a, it was a relatively minor disagreement compared to the Ioannidis and the Sunstein issue. Um, but really what happened with Spiegelhalter was he's been analyzed, he, he was commenting on a, an article that appeared in, uh, I guess, one of the British newspapers about, which was comparing the, um, the British cases to the Italian cases, and I'm not sure if it was the deaths or the just the total number of cases, but my understanding of it is that the newspaper suggested that the British cases were rising at a faster rate than the Italian. And Spiegelhalter posted an analysis where he showed a plot where if you look at it to the naked eye, it obviously looks like the, the, the lines are not distinguishable in terms of which one's going up faster or which one's going up slower. And uh, really, the, the disagreement there was maybe more of a technical nature, but it's really one of also kind of having a uh, presenting the data or presenting the analysis in an accurate fashion. Because what he took from that was to basically prove, you know, what as he said, by formal analysis, that the rates are the same. Um, or, you know, but that's actually not what that analysis shows, as, you know, anybody who's kind of taken kind of a statistics course. The first thing that you're taught in terms of hypothesis testing, you test a null hypothesis and you might have evidence to reject that hypothesis, but if you don't have evidence to reject it, it doesn't mean that the hypothesis is true. It just means you don't have evidence. It could be, it could be in this case that the Italian cases are going much, hot, much faster up. It could be that they're exactly the same. It could be that, they're, uh, that Italian is much less. So that, my, my point there was that it was just a misleading graphic and um, kind of from a technical point of view, there should have been a quantification of the uncertainty, which he pointed out and which I, I saw was kind of in the fine print of the title of the plot. But really, this whole episode reminded me of a uh, of a book I read in high school, a very popular statistics book. I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, How to Lie with Statistics, which mm -hmm, is kind yeah. of a class. And in that in that book, I mean, it's, it's, it's still a great book. Uh, you know, Daryl Huff, the author, goes through you know, the ways in which you can present data in a perfectly um, honest way, so to speak, but it's actually very dishonest because you kind of know what people are going to see. 
you know, and you put something in the fine print, it's like, well, there it is, but nobody's going to look at that, and especially somebody who doesn't know the formal stuff, which is the people who are mostly reading the newspapers or, may, or following the social media on this stuff. So my, my issue there was more of the way it was presented. I didn't think this was particularly an important question in the first place. I mean, really, who? I mean, personally, it doesn't really, I don't think it's really relevant whether you're going worse than Italy or the same as Italy, because Italy was pretty bad. Um, so that, that wasn't really an interesting question to me. Um, but it was more so that, you know, if, if we're going to be putting forward, and I think this is what stuff we're going to talk about a bit today, uh, here, um, if you're putting forward these data analysis or these models, you know, you know, they have a weight to them, especially to, to people who don't know what, what's in them. Cause it's kind of like a black box to people who aren't familiar with it. And so it carries some weight as if, well, this is what the analysis says, or this is what Spiegelhalter says, who's a very well-known statistician, especially in Britain. So it must be true. Um, and I think that a lot of that actually was responsible for some of the delayed responses, which is this reliance on experts to give us advice and the experts' opinions in this case, you know, really were no better. They're actually worse than what common sense would dictate. And so that's kind of what, got me into, uh, so then that was Spiegelhalder, but um, the Ioannidis um, discussion, actually, let, let me talk about um, Sunstein, which, which gets me back to really what got me thinking about this and what, what kind of really got me um, riled up a bit, because he, he wrote something in late February, this is in Bloomberg, I guess he, he writes a column in Bloomberg every week, but, and it was in late February where he, the, the it was about coronavirus, and at that point, um, my remember my memory of it is that we didn't um, at that time have many cases in the United States. I don't know how many there were, um, but there were cases. But I think the first two sentences of his article were something like, uh, "Nobody knows for sure what the risk, what the magnitude of the risk is of coronavirus, but something like." I can guarantee you it's not as bad as you think. Or something so like it's that. a contradiction that's, already. <laughs> yeah, that's paraphrasing what he said, but that is what he said. Um, and that, that alone is a contradiction. And it kind of, the, the article goes on to then talk about um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of previous situations that he's kind of drawing parallels to. Um, things like other, other pandemics, things like um, swine flu or, or, things, or Ebola or other, you know, diseases that are very much kind of in the same vein as as coronavirus but also um he he may have he may or may not have drawn parallels to things like hurricanes or natural disasters that people we panic about certain things and his point is you know we panicked about these things before they didn't turn out to be really anything too serious um and therefore we, you know, we shouldn't panic again because obviously our panic in those cases was irrational. So we're being irrational to panic now. That already, I'll get to that, which I think is wrong on its already, but it ignores, first of all, it ignores the fact that maybe the reason it wasn't so bad before is because we panicked. Maybe, maybe not, you know, but that, that's, that's always a possibility. But the real um, kind of issue and what's na the naivety of this is for one, it's equating our ignorance now to things, to our ignorance in the past. And it's basically, um, so this is, this is what I've called the uh, Sunstein-Costanza effect, or the Sunstein-Costanza fallacy. I don't know if you know of, uh, you know, George Costanza. George Costanza, from yeah, of course. Seinfeld, yeah. who is, you know, a notoriously failed guy and who lived with his parents, had no job, had no, you know, had no money. And one of the episodes, he wakes up, uh, or he comes in, and he says, you know, I've realized that my life is a complete failure. Every decision I've ever made has been wrong. Every instinct I've ever had has been the wrong instinct. Um, so I'm going to do the opposite of what my instincts tell me from now on, because if my instincts are always wrong, the opposite must be right. And that's, you know, that's not far off of what Sunstein is suggesting here, which is if we look into the past of all the times when we had a severe uncertainty about what was going on and the way that we reacted then. And then we can kind of look in hindsight and see, well, yeah, it wasn't as bad. In hindsight, it turned out not to be as bad as we thought it might have been. That you can now kind of project that hindsight as foresight mm -hmm. in that now we're ignorant again. And our ignorance now is just like ignorance in the past. 
therefore uh, our foresight should be that, well, maybe we should just ignore it. And what this, this also kind of mis misconstrues is that the, the specific event that we're talking about, it takes the specifics of the situation totally out of the equation. You know, the specifics of the past were swine flu or, you know, some natural disaster or whatever. The specifics of this case are the coronavirus. It takes all of that out and it just looks at us as, you know, limited people, un, you know, uncertain and un, unknowing about, you know, what was actually going to happen. It just says that, well, I'm as ignorant now as I was then and therefore my actions should kind of uh, match that. So that, that's, that's one part of the naive uh, probabilism view. But the, 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 the other part is, that, is this focus on, well, that's a naive view. And the probabilism part is that he went on to talk in that article. And a lot of people were doing this uh, at that time, which is, it's very unlikely to spread or it's very unlikely, you know, how often does a worldwide pandemic happen? You know, we haven't had one. I don't know. I don't want to say exactly when we haven't had one since, but 1918 is the one that everyone uh, kind of latches onto. There have been other pandemics since then. Um, so the, 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 the chance that any given disease is, uh, turns into a pandemic is very small. And that might very well be true. But that's not the metric that I'm particularly care, that I am interested in thinking about in this particular case. And so in that, in that paper, and what, what I was talking about is that there's different levels of uncertainty. And it's not always about the chances or the you know the likelihood of something happening so he's focusing on the likelihood it's not always about the likelihood that something happens but on the consequences or in the desired action or the desired kind of you know what's the goal of our actions right so the first thing you know my first goal when i'm faced with this situation of a pandemic is you know personally i'm thinking about um you know how am i going to survive it am i going to have enough food am i going to you know be able to avoid you know ruin from this. And so there I'm just thinking about very coarse grain, the possibilities. What is the possibility that this, um, that this thing spreads to, you know, where basically the situation we're in right now? What's the possibility and how can I protect myself against that? How can I survive that situation if that situation arises? Um, only once, I, only then, and that's what a lot of people, that's what is called the panic. That's where people are going to the store buying all kinds of food. They're, they're kind of, uh, they're preparing for that worst case scenario because they're considering the possibilities and they're trying to guard against total ruin. They're trying to survive. They're not trying sure. to um, squeeze out the, you know, the most likely outcome and to try to, it's like winning a bet. I mean, if I'm trying to win a bet against you, you know, maybe sometime in January, we could have bet that this situation we're in right now wouldn't have happened. And it might be, a, you know, we, it could have been that this was a very likely scenario, a very unlikely scenario at that time. So we're happy to make that bet. But I still wouldn't avoid going to the store and buying extra food or I still wouldn't, you know, avoid those precautions because these are two different um, objectives. It's like insurance, um, right, I suppose, in a way. Well, you know, this is kind of, yeah, this is like the extreme kind of insurance because I'm trying to basically just survive at all costs. I'm not even trying mm. to... It's kind of like if your house is burning down, you, you know, insurance, you would like to get the house back. But the first thing is I got to run out. I got to get out of the house first and I'll worry about getting my house back later. So that's the, the second level, you know, aside from the possibilities, the second level, what I talked about was think about the plausibility. So, I mean, what's a plausible scenario? Of course, it's always possible. And you have these people kind of on Twitter who are, you know, whether they're trolls or not, but, you know, the possibility that an alien comes and, you know, cuts my head off is, of course, that's possible, but I'm not worried. <laughs> yeah. you know, that, you know, but you, when you're, when you're thinking about protecting yourself, you know, the first is trying to survive. The next is trying to basically protect what you already have. So that's where I'm thinking about the plausibility of, well, is it plausible that this thing could happen? Is it plausible that my house could, could catch on fire? Of course it's plausible. So I have insurance. Is it plausible that I could get into a car accident. Yes, so I wear a seatbelt, mm -hmm. um, or I have car insurance. It's 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 also possible. It might be relatively unlikely. I certainly hope so. Um, and you know, it, it seems to be relatively unlikely on any given time that you drive that I drive my car that it, that it, to get in an accident. But there's always the possibility. It's always plausible. So I try to hedge. You know, that's where that's where 
we hedge against what we already have to try to protect it. We don't gain from that. We just kind of are hedging from loss. We're trying to protect against loss. And the last thing, the last consideration of something like this is the consideration of probability. So whereas for Sunstein and for a lot of people who I think work in uncertainty in economics, psychology, even in statistics, the first thing you think about is probability. What's the probability? What's the probability? That, you know, that's only kind of a luxury you have once the other stuff has been taken care of. And in this case, it's clear that, you know, the last thing that anyone really cares about in this situation is profiting off of it or being right about a specific thing. Um, you know, maybe you do care about that after you've already kind of secured your assets and then you can go and short the stock market or whatever it is that you want to do but that's kind of that's a very low priority thing so you know that that was kind of my um my issue with sunstein and now i think a lot of people have caught on to what he was saying is kind of very misguided and i think um may have been part of the things that were behind i don't know if he was so influential in this but i remember in late january early february mid-February, even, you know, probably even through late February when the government were, co were coming out in America. I don't know what it was like in um, Canada. The, uh, they're coming out and saying um, the, the risk to the general public is low. They kept saying that over and over and over. They said that in Canada too. All and, the time. Yeah, and I, I guess I just didn't know what that really meant. I mean, uh, in terms of the, the chance that any given person gets it is low. I don't know if that's, that's true either because it seems like now they're saying 70, sometimes they say that 70% mm. of people, of course they don't have, have any idea. Um, but risk isn't just about probability, it's about the consequences. So um, we don't, we don't you know, we, we protect ourselves against terrorist attacks. We try to take precautions against airplanes crashing and things like that, even though those things also might have very low chances, but they have very high consequences. Um, the final person you brought up there was um, Ian Edis. And that kind of gets us towards, so really what I was talking about so far with um, Sunstein was kind of on the probability side of things, which is my, you know, my primary um, area of the things that I think about is terms of prospectively looking forward, what should we be thinking about to try to position ourselves and, you know, put ourselves in the best possible position in the future, you know, to today, tomorrow, next week, next month. That's probability because that actually does require, you know, some kind of model and understanding of where we are, where we were, where we are and where we're going. And we care about mostly where we're going. Statistics is usually most is most useful in a situation where you're looking back and you have data and you're analyzing the data. Uh, and what Ioannidis uh, wrote an article mid-March about was instead of calling this a what he's, you know, what, what he said was being called a once in a century um, pandemic. He was calling it a once in a century data fiasco because he was saying this is a situation where we're making a lot of very major decisions without having um, the you know having the right amount of data or having the right data to make the decision. Um, and so at first, and he he seems to have kind of the, the problem with it, with with Ioannidis in particular is that he actually doesn't say anything of any substance. So he he kind of says we don't have enough data and then talks out of both sides of his mouth and suggests that, well, you know, we should kind of be more cautious and we shouldn't make these drastic mo mo movements. But then when he's on CNN, he says, you know, that he was on lockdown and he's more than happy to be on lockdown to take as a precautionary measure. So, you know, what is it? It's almost like he's, he's going to have a, he's going to have a quotation and a soundbite to point to and to say, I, I, I agreed with this kind of no matter what happens. And that's a whole different story. You know, that kind of, is, is the kind of thing that, um, well, drives me, you know, I don't like it, drives me crazy, but I think it, it's something that I, I mean, think. I, I think when you have a storm coming, you don't wait to get data, right? You just go inside, you shelter yourself. Data well, you can think about later. I think that's common sense in a way. It, it's, ab it's absolutely common sense, right? But, he, and he's all, but the other thing is this idea that you can't, that we don't have the right data, we don't have enough data to act. This isn't a situation, this isn't like an academic, and I wrote another article about this um, that actually, to my surprise, got kind of picked up and translated into different languages. And I, I guess because Ioannidis was having some influence, especially in Greece, potentially. But it was really just a response to the Ioannidis article pointing out some of its issues. The, um, you know, 
we're in a real life situation here. There's no such thing as not no data, not enough data to act. The data you have is the data you have. And it, there's no such thing as more data. It is the data and it's the information. And it might be very little information. It might be very noisy or, uns or there might be things wrong with it. That's the information you have to act on. And it's not like an academic uh, scenario where you can defer the decision to later and say, well, um, yeah, you know, I don't know. It's inconclusive. Let's collect more data and make a decision next week. Or, you know, so it actually, I guess, calls to mind one of my favorite philosophers who's a Canadian. And I don't, so uh, Neil Peart, um, the drummer from Rush, uh, there's, they have a song where the, uh, the lyric is, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. And, you know, in this case, you know, not having enough data to act, not acting is an, act, is an action. So you have to make an action. That's the, the situation you're in is that you have to do something and not doing anything is doing so it, it wasn't at least to me, to me, it was obvious. I think a lot of people with using their common sense, it's obvious, but it's only obvious kind of if you, if you take this view of, well, we can't look at where we are now. We have to look at where we're going to be, but it's also just easy common sense to me because look, I don't, I should say, not, nothing that we've talked about, actually, and I don't claim to know anything even about coronavirus in particular. Um, I mean, you know, I, I know as much as I probably know less than you know in that I had because I, I won't read about the specifics of the virus. You know, I hear what I hear on the, in the news and I'm not an expert in this stuff. But it, it's, it's not that's really less relevant, especially since I don't think people who study this stuff for a living even know very much about it or know enough about it to make definitive statements. It's about how do we make decisions in this uncertain circumstances. And what I, what I was looking at and what kind of keyed me in was, I had no inside information on this. I'm looking at China and I, I haven't looked at, I never really paid attention to the data coming out of China. And it seems like now the data coming out of China might've been questionable, but it doesn't, I don't care what the data says. They shut down an entire city of 15 million people, mm -hmm. 10, 10, a million people they lock them down and they have people walking around the streets with machine guns or you know with guns and not letting people out of their house do they do that and you know i guess if you want to draw these comparisons to the flu people were saying we don't shut down our economy for the flu because then fifty thousand people die a year okay now i don't know if they have the flu in china but i assume they have diseases you know over the course seasonal things that happen do they have military patrol in the streets in a typical year um, because of the flu? I, I, I doubt. I don't think so. I haven't heard about that. So this is obviously an extreme reaction from them. So that signals that there must be something going on, whether or not the data says it or not, they're worried about something. And then we even had the benefit of waiting until after Italy, right? Italy was, you know, was turning into a disaster before, before we were. Do you think Italy would lock down the entire north of the country and then the entire country if this wasn't bad? So it's more about looking at the actions that other people are taking in response to this. And they don't want to take those actions unnecessarily. They don't do that under normal circumstances. So I don't think you need very much specific information or specific data points about this particular disease or virus or whatever to know that common sense says, I better look into this or I better you know, guard yeah. against this. So One that, of the that's things I, that the common sense people were saying is we need to implement a travel ban. And in Canada and in the United States, we kept hearing, you know, travel bans don't work. They're ridiculous. Now there's travel bans everywhere. Uh, what gives here? What's, what's happening? I mean, um, there seems to be a discrepancy between the experts and the public. And to what extent can we rely on in situations like this on common sense? Because uh, on the one hand, um, you know, you don't want to blindly trust experts who, as you said, may not necessarily know what they're doing statistically. And on the other hand, you don't want to go over towards uh, conspiracy theories, you know, 5G, all of these other things you know so to what extent do you balance those two well you know in, in, to some extent right there, there's a point at which common sense is all you have i mean in some common sense is all you ever have but you know sometimes your common sense is let me trust the expert right but you know the, the, the this stuff to me at least isn't anywhere close to the realm of you know conspiracy theory i mean is it a conspiracy theory that a disease can be passed human to human i mean this no. is the right so the stuff that we were first hearing were things like we have no evidence, or you know, I don't know exactly if they said this for travel bans, but something like travel bans don't work, okay? 
um, why don't travel bans work? I, you know, I, I don't, I have no idea. No travel ban, you might say, isn't the best way to do this. I, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if you have people not coming into a place who people who could be sick, not coming into a place, um, it sounds like it's a net neutral, but probably net positive. So it shuts down that one, you know, you might say, well, we have more cases inside the people outside are less of a concern. That's fine. You can still shut them out and avoid that extra bit of uh, complexity. Of, yeah. um, masks don't work. I mean, I think that the Surgeon General, you know, originally, or people said that, that there, there was no data that, that, that masks work. And I don't understand. I don't know if they said that particularly, but how do masks not work? Why do doctors wear masks? Um, why does everybody who does surgery wear a mask if it doesn't work? You know, does it work for them because they went to medical school and not for me because I don't know how to put it on right? You know, and I even had people tell me, and these are people who are medical people saying, masks increase your risk of getting infected if you're not already infected because the, the, the stuff will get stuck in the mask and then you, it's just kind of sitting there waiting for you to breathe it in. Um, I mean, it, it's saying that, you know, all these things, I mean, it, it's like, well, and now, of course, they're saying that masks work. But, you know, other thing, travel ban, human to human transmission was the one that, mm -hmm. you know, I was getting emails from my university. And, and really what kind of got me talking about this at all was seeing the emails coming out of uh, the administration of my school um, in, uh, in late January saying that, you know, there's, well, one, there's no evidence. We don't, you know, we don't think that people who don't have symptoms can spread it. Uh, or and there's no you know there was at that time no evidence of human to human transmission um, and all this stuff and it's you know just this is just common sense of first of all don't most diseases we deal with get past human to human um, it, you know do you have to be shit coughing all over the place to to transmit a disease um, it's basic you know common sense of well maybe maybe that is the case but maybe we can at least let's not make that assumption until we know. So they seem to be willing, and this is where the data comes in. It's, you know, the, the absence of evidence thing, but in this case, it's that we have a lack of data, you know, having no data that masks work is not data that masks don't work, you know, yeah. and, and they're, they're perfectly willing to make the assumption on one, to, on one side of it, where instead of making the assumption on the other side, which is, you know, you can make the assumption on one of two sides. Either you can, without any information, you can assume that masks work or you can assume that masks don't work. And for some reason they decide, let's make the assumption that masks don't work. Um, yeah. But why not make the assumption that is more, more cautious, you know, more conservative. Um, and, and I think that some of this um, gets into, um, Oh, did you have something to say on that? Yeah, actually, I was wondering about that, you know, just in terms of statistics and the whole absence of evidence is evidence of absence thing. You know, on, on Twitter, you say the following. I have a very nice quote from you. Statistics has become a branch of rhetoric. For any argument you want to make, there's usually a statistic that can support it. If not, there's always a, quote, model that can support it. This is the UK approach. For many of my listeners, especially Canadian listeners, I think that, to be quite frank, Americans are better with challenging, I suppose, authority or challenging academia. But especially for my Canadian listeners, such a tweet may seem quite alarming. St statistics, we are taught, is just about facts. And we are taught to respect experts. We're taught to respect authority, to be more or less complacent about it. Would you explain what you mean by that tweet and how it applies to the UK specifically? Well, well, I think that question and that attitude you just described uh, about trusting, being taught to trust this is exactly why this is a, um, it is exactly why it's such an effective form of rhetoric because mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing that you, if you don't know any better, I mean, really, the, there's, a, there's really a narrow, um, a very small fraction of people who know enough to question a particular model in a particular situation or to say, well, this is, you know, or to say, well, I don't have the data, but here's why that doesn't make any sense. Or here's why they're probably missing. There's very few people who can do that. I mean, even, even, you know, me, you know, as I'm a statistician, but I don't know everything there is to know about statistics in, and how it applies in every little situation. Because you, you not only need to know the technical side of how the statistics, how the methods work, but you have to know 
kind of the dom you need the domain knowledge to understand you know how the data was collected where it came from where the models come from what the assumptions what assumptions are being made and what those assumptions mean um, and so I think that the UK approach so specifically to coronavirus for a second but then if you you can take this outside of coronavirus it actually applies much more widely um, but the UK approach as I you know understood it was they were relying on this this idea of herd immunity um, because certain models that they had and certain experts whether they were I don't know if they were statisticians or they were biologists or, or some combination of that were kind of relying on this idea which we seem to believe happens for things like the flu they were kind of assuming that once you get the disease you're immune to it uh, and so they were relying on this idea that let's just kind of gradually expose people to this they'll get better and then um, eventually we'll have enough of a kind of a, an immunity where we'll kind of phase this thing in phase this thing out and we'll all be done um, and I think that their initial model probably predicted that some number of people would die from this it might have been around 10,000 I don't know the exact numbers um, I try not to focus on the exact numbers because those are also coming out of a model anyway but it was something that they considered to be reasonable although that alone is a whole other kind of question of what what is a tolerable amount of death uh, and how are you going to enact a policy that kind of knowingly uh, or at least you think knowingly uh, will lead to some number of deaths in this case a relatively large number of deaths 10,000 but then a couple of days later a couple of weeks later another model came out this was from uh, I guess this is the one attributed to Ferguson which was projecting I don't know, 500,000 deaths, something much, much higher, on, on the order of hundreds of thousands of deaths, and that eventually changed the UK decision to go in a totally different direction. Now, where's the truth? Uh, I don't know. I mean, 500,000 deaths might be too high, 10,000 deaths might be too low. But at first, you know, they were really projecting, you know, Johnson was up there and he had his, his um, henchmen, uh, who are the head scientific um, people, whoever they are, uh, in Britain, I don't know the system very well, but they were, you know, going up there very authoritatively saying this is what's going to happen. And this is, um, you know, this is what we know. We're scientists. And, you know, it, it's very, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, to me, it's a big problem. I think that, you know, being in America, I guess, has somehow I have the luxury, I don't know about luxury, but I'm more exposed to this skepticism of, there's a there's a great there's a great skepticism in general of academia, but there's just a skepticism of government. There's a skepticism of this idea of expert. I mean, it's kind of it's almost what the country was was founded on, and it's kind of in the DNA of of the country. And so um, it's hard for me to really I didn't really fully understand this or appreciate this actually until I went to other countries like Britain or you know I, I've been there a couple of times. And I thought well it really is different how people think. Um, so you know on, on the topic of rhetoric and I think that actually this this is what, what happens where statistics is um, has become why has statistics become a branch of rhetoric in my opinion I think it's not just my opinion so I mean you, you have the uh, the Daryl Huff book the how to lie statistics book that was written in like the 1950s and so statistics has always been something that people have uh, been skeptical of because you can kind of twist things to, to in your favor you can cherry pick statistics and people have always kind of known that intuitively it's become even more so though nowadays because of the success stories of you know things like statistics data science AI and all this stuff where you actually we actually have stories and cases where these methods have been very influential and very helpful you know they've been they have done good for us um, you know, things like, you know, this basic stuff like the internet search engines and stuff like that, which has changed our lives and have, has made things much better. But what the, what these don't understand is that, you know, first of all, those are very specific applications and they're also, you know, the domain in which statistics works best is the domain in which you have a lot of data and you understand where the data came from and how the data kind of behaves and how the data relates to you know relates to the whole situation that you're trying to um, understand so ex it designed experiments things like that are the, um, the the really the classic the case where statistics is most well understood but a case where you have many replicates 
of some some uh, some phenomenon that you're interested in. Um, the situation we find ourselves with the uh, with the coronavirus and with a lot of real world decisions or policies is we don't have a lot of data. We have to make a decision based on one data point, and we have to make a decision based on zero data points, and that's where we have no choice but to rely on common sense. And the problem then becomes the people who are, you don't become an expert based on common sense. You become an expert based on your understanding of a specific narrow um, technique. And when that technique no longer applies, you know, the expert's opinion is no longer very helpful, but that, 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 per, you know, typically there's a, and this is, there's a quote, I guess there's an idea from, um, I don't know if it's an idea so much as a, a phrase from uh, from Kahneman's book on thinking fast and slow. But he, he talks about um, theory-induced blindness, this idea that once you've kind of mastered a theory and you've thought about the theory and you've understood the theory and everything in the context of the theory, it's, it's very difficult to think outside of that theory. And, you know, once you see the world as a bunch of statistics and data points and things that you draw lines through, it's hard to... You, you can't really think outside of that. So you basically have, whatever common sense you had before, you basically get lost, your, you've trained your common sense out of you to this is the tool, this is the way that I see the world. And I think that that's the, the skepticism of, you know, of experts. I think you have to take into account, well, what is this person an expert of? I mean, I'm not, there, there, is, a, there is such a thing as expertise. Not everybody's an expert in every, just because you're an expert in one thing doesn't make you an expert in other things. So what's this person an expert in? And are they talking about that thing? Or are they stretching? You know, that's kind of what I what I at least try to keep in my mind when I'm processing this information. But just to, to try to, if I can take a minute or two to relate this outside of coronavirus, if you're familiar with the, the replication crisis in science, this idea yeah. that, um, you know, most of scientific research in a lot of fields, in, in some fields, is you know, wrong, uh, or highly questionable. And, you know, to, 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 to address the question of, you know, is this the statement that I made about whether statistics is a branch of rhetoric, is that kind of itself, a is that itself rhetoric or is that kind of real? Um, well, if you look, I mean, over the past couple of years and I followed this, I'm not directly involved with this, but I followed the discussions and the arguments over how to address this replication crisis. And, just, just last, and so I should say, you know, where does this replication crisis come from, for those who don't know, is from the widespread use of statistics in all of these different disciplines, social sciences, hard sciences, soft sciences, you know, everything in between. And so at some point you had statistics was used for very specific experimental cases, you know, back in the whatever, 1920s, 1930s, you're doing agriculture, agricultural stuff. Event, and now we come to the present day where statistics is being used for almost everything in every scientific field. And so it became more mainstream in academia and eventually that took the leap into the general consciousness, into business, to the point where now there's enough people who think they know enough or who understand the buzzwords enough to where it actually becomes an effective tool for rhetoric. Um, but we have this replication crisis and I, I, in, in last year, so there's people always publishing on how we should address the replication crisis, this and that. Um, there was an article in Nature by a group of people and they were, they were just, well, I don't know if it was an article so much as an editorial or, or whatever, but their, their comment there was stop using the word statistical significance and stop using the word confidence interval, use the word compatibility interval instead. So they're actually, you know, in, in publishing something like that, you're acknowledging, they're not changing anything about the methods, they're not changing anything about the way you think in a technical sense, they're changing about the words you use to communicate this. I mean, that's the definition of rhetoric. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're acknowledging that this is a rhetorical device and that the words that we use affects the way that things get communicated. Uh, I think the American Statistical Association may have I don't know if they banned the words significance, but they released an entire article about how significance, statistical significance shouldn't be used. So they're turning this into, kind of, you know, it's, it's not, you know, the statisticians are also kind of complicit in turning this into a political, you know, kind of a sociological, political, mm -hmm. and a rhetorical issue. Um, that article in Nature I mentioned too um, had something like 800 signatories. So it was written by three people 
but 800 people signed on saying, I agree with this. So it was almost like a, a petition, uh, more so than a, a kind of a scholarly piece of work. So I think that, you know, it's not far fetched at all to, to, to make this statement that it's, it's, it's rhetoric because, um, of course, I don't want to say that all statistics is bad and should never be used and should never be trusted. But unfortunately, the thing that, that, you know, when I hear a statistic quoted and I hear it being used to push for a particular agenda, that's when, you know, alarm bells start to go off. So um, that's kind of mostly what that, that statement was in relation to, and particularly in relation to this, uh, cr this ongoing coronavirus stuff, because really nobody knows, nobody really understood, especially at the time that I wrote that, what was going on. And the focus at that time was still on kind of the, what the data says. And the data is only up to the present day. And again, we, it wasn't taken into account kind of what, where things were headed. And anything that it was trying to take into account where things were headed were based on models, which themselves are just projections. They're mathematical projections based on assumptions, which can't be verified. So they're even kind of... And the assumptions could be wrong. Could be the assumptions wrong. could be wrong. The assumptions, you know, are, you know, could be... The assumptions themselves carry with them implications about how something's behaving, and, and um, it's not always. It's, they're not those things. Those implications aren't always very well understood either. So, um, and and yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's just important to keep that in mind. I would say one of the ways to sort through, I think, this problem with the noise that's inherent in decision making and policy making and public health now that we're seeing and dealing with the coronavirus is to imbue policymakers and experts, so to speak, with skin in the game, right? In order to ensure that they are making decisions that actually uh, allow them to incur some risk from the decisions that they're making. Uh, how can we do that now to what institutional framework, what institutional reforms can we make to ensure that that happens now so that future potential pandemics or emergencies can be handled more effectively? That's a good question that I, I don't, I don't, I unfortunately, I don't think I have the answer to that in this case, because the, um, I mean, it's almost against the, uh, it's got, it's, you know, it's kind of almost against the DNA of a policymaker or a bureaucrat to have such skin in the game. And it's kind of, so it's kind of built into bureaucracy that no particular individual has any responsibility for anything. So as long as um, decisions are being made at a bureaucratic level, it's, it's definitely hard to, um, to do that. I mean, I, I can't, so I can't answer it, unfortunately. I wish I had an answer because that's what I would be talking about nonstop and trying to get it to, um, to happen. The, the, um, you know, the only thing that comes to mind for me, and this is not exactly in the realm of coronavirus or policymaking, but going, you know, going back to this side, replication crisis, which I think maybe has more parallels to this stuff than, than immediately meets the eye just because, you know, it's a very specific context, but you have scientists who are making claims, you know, factual claims about the world. And they also somehow, you know, it's somehow magical that they, that I can write a paper with my name on it that is completely wrong, publish it in a journal, get credit for it. Um, and, and then you find out three, three years later that you do a study and says this was completely wrong three years later and uh, nothing happens to me um, yeah. because, because it got re peer reviewed. And so the peer reviewers who also are unknown because they're anonymous, uh, they signed off on it and it was deemed to be correct and sound at that point in time. And therefore it's kind of like, you know, in some way, it's kind of like the invasion of Iraq. Well, we, based on the information we had at that time, we believed very strongly that they had these weapons. And so the decision that we made to, to invade was, uh, was the right decision. And there's a certain um, kind of logic which says, well, okay, I know that you can only do the best you can, I guess it's true, but at the same time, if the decision is wrong and the decision had serious consequences, um, then there has to be consequences passed on to the person uh, making making that decision or writing that paper or drawing that conclusion. So, um, the, the, you know, I've thought about this in terms of in that context, and I, I believe that. So this was this was something I wrote under the cons, under the heading of what I call the fundamental principle of probability, which is just that probability actually going back to what we talked earlier with Sunstein, 
is very naturally tied. And actually the philosophy of probability, the history of probability is all goes back somehow to betting or gambling um, exercise, you know, some kind of gambling or betting. So the, the, no matter whether you take frequentist or Bayesian or whatever view of probability you take, obviously if I'm, if I want to know how often a, 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 the dice come up seven, I just count the frequencies. Uh, if I want to know how much you're willing to bet me that a coronavirus develops into a pandemic, I take your belief and we say, well, how much are we willing to bet? And that's kind of the implicit probability. So if you're making a scientific claim that your work is correct and replicable, then, and you're using statistical methods and probabilistic assessments to convince me of that, then you should stand by those assessments to the, to the extent that you should have, uh, you should be willing to put up risk the risk some amount of whatever i mean let's just say money to if to the extent that i can come i say okay you think it's 80 percent likely to replicate i think you're wrong and if if it replicates you win if, if it doesn't i win and you know you pay mm -hmm. the odds there's a very now i know it's against kind of it's it sounds kind of extreme because it's kind of against the mindset of scholarly research in some sense but it's actually built into the mechanism of probability that this is actually what how probabilities are most are best understood to have actual concrete meaning and the reason one of the reasons why the the p values or the the things that get published in journals that have statistical um backing the that the meaning of those or the significance of those are way or kind of way out of line and distorted from the you know, the, the kind of the conceptual meaning of what those are supposed to imply is way off the empirical data of what we actually see in the published literature in, in terms of very few things replicating is because they are out of line, you know, kind of they're not staying true to this, uh, this conceptual understanding or this true meaning of what probability is and what it's supposed to be used for. So that's one example. But I mean, I, in terms of policymaking, I don't, I don't really see how to bridge that gap to all of a sudden now you have people on TV or people in the government saying this is what um, this is what we should do and then if they're wrong they're wrong I mean it's difficult right to some, it's, extent, yeah. you know, to, to some extent they should at least be um, help, they should at least be forced to incur the risk that they're putting everybody else uh, that, that they're kind of imposing on everybody else but somehow even that doesn't even you know, hardly feels uh, hardly feels enough because you know it's one person making a decision that's going to impact you know hundreds of millions of people um and if that's the way the system kind of works it, you know there's almost nothing that can be done to uh to hold that to you know to make it kind of fair in the sense of you know making the risks be symmetric but yeah you know i, I think uh, that i think that just to you know the the only thing that i think can be done is more you know and I, more public Kind of scrutiny people you know the general public does hold a lot of kind of power in how things get implemented just because uh, and i think this is also responsible for some of the american um the, you know it's the american mentality but also the u.s has been a little bit bad at responding to this but i i think that it's because it's not we we just wouldn't respond well to somebody coming out in late February saying, okay, we're all shut down. Don't leave your house. People wouldn't comply and people still aren't complying. I mean, that's just not how we do things. Uh, and so there is this kind of skepticism of that. These people don't know what they're doing. I mean, they've, they've made enough mistakes in the past and this was another one because they kind of slowly changed their mind. They've made so many mistakes in the past that why would you trust them now? Um, and so I think the more that somehow we're able to get towards we're bridging the gap between the common sense, kind of general common sense about things, but at the same time having hard evidence and having people know what they're doing in the positions to make the right decisions, or at least to guide the right decisions. Um, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem to suit bureaucracy very well. But, I would uh, agree with you there. Last question. Um, you mentioned the replication crisis. So on that note, I'd like you to talk about where we can find you. Can you talk a little bit about researchers.1? Do you have uh, Twitter, YouTube, Periscope, all of that? 
Um, well, the, 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 the main place to find me would be on Twitter. So my name's Harry D. Crane on Twitter. Um, I, I have a YouTube channel. I post some, some videos there. I've been posting my lectures uh, as I do remote teaching. I've done some Periscope things. That's relatively new to me. But the main place would be Twitter. Um, yeah, other than my um, involvement, you know, other than my teaching and my research, I also run a, a website, a publishing platform called Researchers One. That's the, web, that's the website, researchers.one, O-N-E. And what it is, is it's a peer review. It's a new peer review model. It's a, it's a peer review platform where, um, which is really designed to get back, get us back to where I think peer review should be or where we think it is in terms of the ideals of it. So part of that is cutting, cutting out the middleman and cutting out the bureaucracy of the, the editor, you know, so it, for those who maybe haven't gone through this, this painful process, right? I submit a paper to a journal, to one journal, and I can only do one at a time. Yeah. Uh, and Andrew looks at it, and then he, send, he or she sends it to a, uh, an associate editor, who then sends it to, and that associate editor is going to be usually anonymous to me, and then that associate editor sends it to referees who are anonymous. Those anonymous referees say, this is what's wrong with the paper. Uh, either fix it or reject it. And then we go and we do this kind of for months and months and months and, or they reject it and I have to send it and go through the same process elsewhere. So now there's a good part of this, which is, I mean, sometimes those anonymous referees actually do a good job and say things that are good, that are helpful. Uh, a lot of times they don't, but um, it, you know, anybody, I want things that I say, I, I want the things I write to be checked. And I, if you have something that, if you know that I said something that's wrong, I'd like you to tell me and then I can fix it. Um, but I want you to focus on the things that matter. You know, the fact that you, that you disagree with this particular sentence shouldn't mean that the whole thing gets kind of rejected out of hand. Or the fact that, you know, the, the referee got his paper rejected a week ago, so now he's just mad and wants to reject my paper uh, for any reason at all. And you can always find a reason. I mean, these are things that actually do happen. I mean, it's not, it, it's not, uh, and I, I've been kind of fortunate enough in this process, but these things happen. I've seen them happen. But so the, what researchers one does is it says, okay, that's a good, there's a good part of peer review, a bad part. Let's keep the good part, get rid of the bad part. So you go on there, you post your paper, it immediately gets posted. Um, but so there's no barrier to publication. Um, and so, you might, so part of the no barrier to publication is, well, you can publish anything. It could be totally wrong. That's true. So the kind of the counterbalance to that is, but everything that gets published is open for public review and public discussion. So you can't stop that. I mean, that's not an option that you have. So you post there. And if I come across your paper, I find something wrong with it. I can write, I, I write what's wrong with it. And then the people who read it can kind of weigh who's, who's right and who's wrong. And it's kind of up to the reader at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also acknowledge it, change what you've written, revise. I mean, it's really not meant to be something where I point out what's wrong. I, it's really something where I should be kind of in somewhat of a collaborative spirit where I, I read something, I say, this is, this is good, but I think this can be improved here, or I don't think this is clear. And then it goes back and forth. And I've had some very positive interactions there. I mean, some people, you know, for the most part, the people who are participating in this are, are engaged and they're interested in actually getting into a conversation about this, even if they might have some critical things to say. Overall, it's, it's meant to be constructive. And I've ended up, you know, get developing kind of relationships, you know, friendships or professional relationships with people who've done this. And we've gone back and forth a number of times. Um, because there's a real kind of level of engagement there that's not there when you have three or four middlemen who are passing this thing along, uh, really for the purpose of an administrative uh, exercise, which is, do I accept, do you get to put this journal on your CV or not, uh, instead of the scholarly exercise of this is a discussion, this is a discourse, this is something that other people are going to read, and let's, you know, come to a point at which this is kind of, in its best form and you know this is the most clear and the best possible way to communicate it so that's the goal of it and we're you know uh, anyone might of course encourage to check it out it, you know th there's the main thing about it is that um it's completely open 
open access in you know almost every way. It's open access in that everything that's published there is publicly visible. It's open access and that anyone can publish there in any field and that anyone can review in, you know, and it's also uh, in the sense that you keep your copyright 100%. So we can post your article, but, but you can go and publish it in other journals or at other sites. And I think that's an important thing that if you think about it, I mean, this is kind of a little bit tangential, but from an academic point of view, the craziest thing that I realized is we write these papers, we submit them to one journal, and then the journal takes all of our rights away from publishing that. And we, we only get to publish it in one journal. Why, if you wrote a good paper that's relevant, would you want to only publish it once? You should want to publish it a thousand times. Sure. You know, and so we, we, of course, we know that those, can, those restrictions are kind of out of our hands, but at least as far as we're concerned, we, we want you know, the author to have as much control over this whole process and ultimately on the dissemination of their work as possible. So everything, everything there is kind of with that in mind. And of course, there's probably things we can improve. So anybody who has suggestions there uh, for how we can improve it, um, we'd appreciate that as well. It's a fantastic model. Thank you very much. And I will put, link that in the description box below as I will link your Twitter and your YouTube. You have a great YouTube, by the way, lots of fantastic talks there. Uh, but we're done. Thank you very much, Dr. Crane, for being with us today. And uh, take care. Okay, thanks a lot. Have a good one. Bye.